Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Open Source Summit. Uh, we're excited to be here to tell you tell you about the specific uh, case about serverless data store. Uh, I'm going to start with a few questions. How many of you have heard about serverless workloads? I bet a lot of people. How many of you have heard about stateful workloads? Uh, I suppose a lot of people too. Uh, you have the most typical ones like databases. But how many of you have heard about specific serverless workloads just for stateful applications? Probably not that many. So we haven't seen that many. And this is why This is why uh, we think this is an idea. Uh, so we're trying this new uh, approach, or, 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 or we think not many people are doing this, and, and this is the, the whole uh, premise on, on, on this uh, talk. Next. A little bit about ourselves. I work at... Uh, Rakuten, and I'm in the CNCF. I'm a co-chair in the SIG runtime. And Amarjit works in uh, Kioxia, America. Uh, so next. Okay, so some of the history uh, um, or what we're going to be talking about today is we're going to talk about a little bit of history behind the serverless applications and uh, some of the uh, storage technologies. Then we'll talk about some of the what stateful applications are and how you can uh, see some of these uh, existing applications. Then we'll dive into some of these new storage te technologies like uh, MVME over Fabric, and then RDMA over Converge Ethernet. Then we'll talk about how you can put it all together with Kubernetes with Container uh, Storage Interface, or CSI. Then we'll talk about some uh, stateful uh, type of workloads, uh, very minimal, and that you can do with serverless or the serverless paradigm. Then we'll show you a brief demo. And finally, we'll give you some takeaways and what it looks like in the future. So what's in the books for um, these technologies, for serverless technologies and for um, storage technologies? What can you go back and see how they came about? So if you look at serverless, uh, in 2008, Google App Engine was released. And that's when you basically took an application and just uh, run a script and automatically pushed it over to the Google infrastructure. And Google basically takes care of everything, uh, including uh, scaling and the endpoints and everything you need to, for that application to run. And then basically the devel developer forgets about how that runs in the underneath. Then in 2014, AWS released uh, AWS Lambda, and that's when they took it a little bit further where they said, okay, now you can run these, these specific functions, but you don't have to care how they run in the back. Then in 2015, JAWS was released, uh, JavaScript AWS, and later renamed to serverless framework. And this was a way to uh, say that you can run uh, a, a full-blown application using all these different functions. You could combine with different services in AWS, like AWS uh, AWS API Gateway and uh, Amazon S3. So do that coordination. So this framework allow you allows you to do that. Then in that same year, Kubernetes was released 1.0, and that's when a lot of people started talking about uh, deploying all these different workloads in containers and orchestrating and, and serving them behind load balancers and uh, a full-blown set of infrastructure using containers. Then in 2016, GCP released its own version about uh, functions, you know, how you can run functions just like AWS Lambda. 
And then it followed on with some of the other cloud providers like uh, Microsoft Azure. Then in 2018, Knative and other open source projects were released for, as a way for you to run serverless on top of uh, Kubernetes. Then what can we say about storage technologies? Um, a long time ago, SCSI was released as an interface to uh, interact with storage in a faster way. Uh, and then later, much later in 2011, NVMe 1.0 was released as a way to talk to all these different solid state drives. So faster storage emerged, and then it was a way to kind of uh, you know address some of that the interface between uh, your computer or, or your host and, and and all these different SSD storage devices. Then 2016, our CE, which is RDMA over converged Ethernet v2, was released, and that's a way to use Ether Ethernet as a, a medium to access uh, memory directly, like uh, RDMA, uh, direct memory. And in that same year, NVMe over Fabric, the standard was released, and that's a way to uh, connect to storage devices using NVMe. Uh, over different media like Ethernet or or fiber channel or some other different uh, fast type of media. Then in 2016, that same year, the Linux kernel added support for NVMe over Fabric. And then last year, just uh, the Linux kernel 5.0 uh, added support for NVMe over TCP, which is the most widely uh, uh, TCP is like the most widely standard in networking, so so it, it, it could work with multiple NIC cards or multiple uh, hardware interfaces. So what can we say about uh, some of these stateful applications? So let's add a little bit of context behind the stateful applications. So we have different kinds. So we have the, the basic relational databases. You have the MySQL of the world, or the, the, the Postgres of the world, and then MariaDB. So you have a master-slave configuration. Uh, then you have the cluster databases that allow you to have uh, multiple nodes. And then if you want to uh, expand your storage, you would just add additional nodes. You would add just like, uh, you know, you, in example, you have a 10 node uh, uh, database or, or cluster. And if you want, want to, add, to add more capacity, you would just add like five more nodes. And then the, autom the database automatically balances out all the data. So this is kind of like what these cluster databases would do or, or do. And then some examples are like Cassandra DB and Scylla. But then you also have some of the asset type of databases like uh, CockroachDB and FoundationDB that allows you to have that consistency across different regions. Uh, so uh, you could have a region in, in the US East or US West, and then so these databases allow you to have that consistency. And finally, there's the broker type of databases uh, that allows you to subscribe and publish uh, or, or, or clients to publish and send that streaming data so very popular when you're you're processing lots of data and lots of streaming data. And examples of that are Kafka and NATS. So what can we say about Kubernetes and all the stateful uh, uh, application support? So before 1.5, they had a Kubernetes resource, resource called PetSet. And that was a pretty bare bone re, uh, resource for you to just kind of bring up uh, uh, maybe uh, these containers uh, in, in a sort of coordinated way. But then after 1.5, stateful sets as a resource was uh, re released, and that's when people were able to just coordinate, say, master and slave, or when you wanted to, to bring up that specific container. So you could actually do that uh, unique uh, type of uh, workload uh, coordination that you need for uh, stateful applications. But some of those challenges still remain. I mean, you need to you still need to do that coordination between the master and slave. You need to take care of that replication across different nodes. You also need to uh, make sure that you're not corrupting your data. So say like when your container goes down and it needs, it needs to come back up in a, on a different node or Kubernetes node, then it doesn't have to do a crash recovery or, 
or the crash. It, it, it knows about the, that container is doing a crash recovery. So it knows all those different things. And also testing for stateful applications is quite a challenge. Uh, there's this nice tool called Jepsen. Uh, it's an open source tool that allows you to do uh, testing uh, for stateful applications, but yet still uh, pretty challenging to do that testing. So now Amarjit will talk about some of the storage technologies. All right, so let's talk about some of the storage technologies. Uh, to put it in uh, perspective, um, as uh, Rico talked about uh, storage uh, interface history, when SCSI was formed, when SCSI came uh, into existence and, and uh, started to get popular, uh, our storage needs, uh, or the, at that time storage needs, if not in kilobytes, uh, were at least in, in megabytes. Uh, today's storage needs uh, are in terabytes or petabytes. Uh, that's the difference. Also, at that time, um, storage was, um, or the drives, were on servers, um, especially large servers. Uh, today, um, we are talking about containers which come up in seconds or microseconds and they need storage. So that's the difference. But uh, uh, in all those years, uh, there were not much advancements on the interface, not much changes. Uh, one big change came was um, how storage, how data is stored, the underlying media, uh, which originally was basically uh, spinning magnetic disks. Uh, today, the most popular media is uh, flash, uh, flash uh, memory. So in the, in the modern drives, you know, um, magnetic disk media is being replaced by flash memory uh, solid state. So with those changes in the in the demand in the in the market uh, uh, direction uh, from media uh, media of spinning disks to a media of flash, there was a need to come up with a new interface, and that's what is NVMe. Uh, so NVMe is a is a new interface which uh, came into existence almost at at the same time or maybe a uh, few years earlier than the containers. So containers, Kubernetes uh, the, and NVMe, they, from the historical perspective, they came into existing at the same time. So what NVMe does for you is basically it offers um, tremendous speed, enormous speed to uh, send data uh, at a very fast rate. Uh, to compare it to SCSI, uh, SCSI uh, offers sending I.O. commands or storage I.O. commands in one queue and uh, that queue can have at any time uh, up to 64 storage commands. This was good at the time um, SCSI was uh, introduced, but today uh, with the, the change in demand, uh, we need much more than that and uh, hence NVMe uh, came up with a with new standard, with new interface, and also new capabilities. And that capability is NVMe can handle 64,000 commands, uh, storage IO commands, versus only 64 in SCSI. Not only that, NVMe can also offer such 64K queues. So you can have 64K commands in 64K queues. So that's how uh, fast NVMe can be. Uh, most of the modern applications, they are uh, written uh, with the perspective of older storage interfaces, such as a SCSI. So they still don't demand that much speed and performance from the new storage. Hence, uh, if we have to think that, okay, uh, my storage disk is, is much faster. Is my application ready to uh, take advantage of it? Uh, probably not all, but a few modern applications, but, but not all of them. Uh, on top of that, if I have many NVMe interface drives in one, let's say 2U um, server, which can host up to 24 uh, drives, 
can that server and application on the, that server handle or, or, or can consume or throttle uh, all the fast drives? No. So that's where basically uh, uh, the need to have uh, a storage which basically can be centralized in one place and can handle that workload uh, came. So that is basically is NVMe over fabric. So NVMe over fabric is that you disaggregate storage uh, on one node and then uh, all the client nodes on the other side, multiple client nodes, can uh, basically use that as their storage. It offers uh, same type of performance that a local storage would offer because NVMe protocol is designed for that. It's fast and the only bottleneck would be underlying uh, uh, network media, but which is not. Today we are talking about 100 gig or 200 gig um, uh, network speeds. Uh, when we say that, okay, NVMe over fabric can take storage from one node, central node, to uh, multiple client nodes, uh, there are different medias. Ethernet is one of them. There could be fiber channel. So for this session, uh, we'll, we'll focus our, our discussion around Ethernet. So um, Ethernet basically uh, is very standard in most of the data centers, is widely used we can leverage two technologies directly to send NVMe or storage commands over Ethernet. One is RDMA, the other one is a standard TCP. So RDMA is very fast, very efficient. It offers um, direct connect uh, between the um, between the memory um, between two servers, uh, but it requires a specialized hardware. Uh, on the other hand, TCP uh, is a standard uh, networking protocol used for everything uh, that we communicate among servers and nodes. Uh, so if we send NVMe commands over TCP, then uh, we don't need a specialized inter uh, interface. However, um, this requires uh, more CPU uh, power and hence uh, the performance is um, lower as compared to RDMA over converged Ethernet, but it, it's a design choice uh, which um, you as a, as a as an end user infrastructure admin will have to make. Uh, now let's talk about uh, how um, the overall stack fits into operating system, especially Linux. As I said earlier, there are various ways to send NVMe uh, commands over different type of medias, fiber channel, ethernet. Uh, so at the very bottom, those medias, they have uh, technologies to connect with each other. I think we, this is outside the scope of, of this talk, uh, but um, when the network connectivity is established between client and, and the storage node, uh, target node, uh, the NVMe uh, commands which are on one side, uh, you know, bundled in the network frames from target node um, and then being sent to the client node, they get unbundled at, uh, at the, at the, at the uh, kernel level or the module. And in fact, in, in there are, even there are um, a couple of options. You can have um, kernel based uh, NVMe over fabric, also uh, a user space based. Um, that's also kind of a little bit outside the scope. But um, however, this stack shows that, you know, uh, once NVMe over fabric com um, connectivity is established and NVMe commands are unbundled on the, on the client side, the volumes or the drives are available as usual raw or block volumes uh, to the to the client. Hence, the the drive or the volume which client sees client sees is no different than a local drive. This uh, diagram also shows how two nodes, one client which doesn't have a local um, storage for the data store, however, it may have operating systems um, a disk. And then on the other side, there is a target or a storage node which offers storage uh, to multiple client nodes. For the simplicity, I'm just showing one drive here. So the underlying hardware uh, drive basically is uh, used by, uh, by a software that you need a specialized software on the target node. Uh, there are many in, in the market. And then uh, 
that those uh, software they take uh, hardware on the one side virtualize that uh, basically offers you multiple volumes and other other advantages and then send those virtualized storage volumes uh, over a fast ethernet uh, with the, with the choice of technology that you want to use whether rdma or uh, or tcp and on the initiator side or on the client side those uh, drives or volumes are available as raw or block volumes which um, kernel uh, can start utilizing so uh, in the world of kubernetes uh, how does this fit into into kubernetes infrastructure so kubernetes uh, basically entities such as pods they require persistent volumes persist pods uh, need to uh, need to basically access persistent storage via persistent volume claims persistent volume claims are further uh, bound to pers persistent volumes which are like physical volumes so physical volumes uh, persistent volumes they can come from uh, uh, various storage uh, technologies it can be from local storage it can be from a network storage uh, to make this job easier uh, the, the job of attaching persistent storage to pods wherever it comes from um, csi driver uh, is the one which helps here csi driver has a controller which interfaces with uh, with the storage central storage or the local storage depending upon what the csi driver is written for it takes or provisions storage there attaches detaches um, uh, to the to the pods when pods move from one worker node to other node csi driver also takes care of uh, moving that storage So now Rico, uh, Ricardo will talk about um, serverless computing, um, how serverless computing and that framework fits in Kubernetes world. Yeah, so uh, what about the code that you can run for functions, right? So, and, and if you wanna run a stateful type of applications, this is just a simple example where uh, you just writing to the disk, uh, hello, go, hello, world type of application. And then it's just as simple as just driving to a mounted drive here. So you, you're here, you're, uh, instantiating a variable with, with your string. And then, uh, you assume that your MVME storage is mounted on, uh, MNT1 drive and DAT1. Uh, so yeah, so that's it, in essence what a very simple function would do. Uh, but then obviously when you're running a serverless type of paradigm, you would do this many, many times. And if you wanted to extend some of this uh, functionality, you wanna find out when you have events and when you want to trigger these functions. Uh, there's a project called Cloud Events from the CNCF. Uh, and it's a way for you to uh, describe these functions uh, so that they're more portable and they have more consistency and you can share them across your organization. Uh, yeah, in, in this case, it will be something to uh, describe when you want to start and reading something uh, and, and what uh, and decide what you want to do with a specific function. So Cloud Events has bindings for many different languages. Uh, so in this example, it's, a, it's the Go binding uh, for Golang, and we have a uh, receive function here. Uh, so that means when we receive an event, uh, we we can instantiate or we can uh, write a specific uh, something to a drive, to something to some data to to uh, to an NVMe storage. So you can see here at the bottom after you start the receiver. So it's kind of like listening for these events. And when that event triggers, uh, you can say you can write like a, a string or you can write like a, a, a larger amount of uh, uh, data. So in essence, this is how would, it would read for events. 
So what if you want to add more complexity to all your different workloads of uh, uh, serverless type of applications and paradigm, if you want to connect all the different things? So there's also a project called serverless workflow packets, and it allows you to identify um, all these functions that are you, you're going to be using for that specific uh, workflow. Uh, so for stateful applications, you can define, okay, all this read and writes uh, on how you want to read and write data. And you can also identify what type of events uh, will trigger some of these uh, type of storage uh, functions. And then you also want to, you can, or, can identify the, the different states where that workflow can be in. For example, it could be like in a waiting state, it could be in a running state, it could be in a blocking state, whatever uh, the, the type of serverless or in stateful type of uh, application you're actually writing or creating. So now MRJ will talk about the how the uh, orchestrator works and how um, you can put this together with um, uh, the serverless frameworks. All right. So, uh, so far, uh, we have talked about um, storage technologies. We have talked about Kubernetes and we have talked about uh, serverless framework. Let's put everything uh, together. So serverless framework um, are basically um, frameworks to serve um, on demand kind of uh, uh, on demand kind of um, you know needs um, when a when a function uh, basically executes uh, it quickly uh, does its jobs and terminates. So serverless functions are are short lived functions. Uh, Right now, their popular use cases are with stateless applications. Uh, stateful applications, uh, if they ever have to use uh, serverless functions, uh, which are inherently or, or are supposed to be short-lived, need fast, uh, quick provisioning of storage. So uh, let's see how all it fits together. There are multiple serverless frameworks available. Uh, Many of them are still not um, like depending upon our research. They they don't have capability to uh, leverage uh, persistent storage. Uh, one such framework which has the capability to leverage under um, uh, leverage underlying persistent storage is called Fission. Uh, so for the purpose of this session uh, and then also for a demo that we, which we are going to show a little later uh, that for that purpose we have selected uh, fission uh, and then the way uh, basically fission works is um, so it has a central controller uh, and then fission um, it, it runs basically everything on kubernetes and it uses kubernetes native um, custom resources and controllers uh, so the, uh, basically fission uh, serverless framework and then you can know more about uh, uh, this by visiting their website but basically uh, at, a, at a very high level it has an underlying environment which is basically pre-built uh, for type of functions that you are going to run on that environment that pre-built uh, environment is always ready to execute functions and then the second part is is the function you can have one or more functions leveraging one type of environment so um, in one way that fission uh, takes advantage of persistent volume is is to store its own state like type of environment a compiled uh, code of libraries which functions are going to use so that when functions execute they can it's it's readily available that's one like small use case but that's not the uh, that's not the only topic of this discussion our our discussion is around using persistent volumes in the in the functions itself so that's where fission serverless framework is is very basically helpful and it allows us to uh, take advantage of underlying uh, persistent volumes. There could be many use cases uh, of having a persistent volume in, uh, in 
uh, serverless. Uh, so one or few use cases uh, on the same line that uh, we could think about was, let's say you have a large stream or a large uh, set of data uh, coming in, and then you need to process that data. Uh, either uh, individually as, as it comes or you, you basically buffer that data until it, it is large enough to be processed. So it could be a data coming from, um, from sensors or, or any other place or it could be a media also like photo upload just for the simplicity's sake. Uh, it could be a photo upload that, that users upload and then, then there is a processing at the background uh, or a video upload. So that is, uh, the, I mean, th there could be multiple use cases, but this is one of the, one of the, or one of the use case. And in those use cases, you want to uh, still keep uh, the nature of serverless functions, which is uh, short, short lived, that type of nature, you want to keep that. But at the same time, I uh, want to keep the capability to process that data later on. So in those cases, short lived functions, they can just receive the data and then exit. And then after that, you can have other ways to process the data, either via other functions, which gets triggered uh, through some other triggers, or uh, you can have usual Kubernetes uh, jobs or other, um, you know, uh, ready uh, or other applications which are already running there. But the idea here is that, uh, you know, uh, the underlying persistent volume media will serve as a cache or as a buffer, which basically is going to be shared um, by the other functions uh, or, the, or the jobs. Uh, so, uh, Putting this all um, together, this is what uh, our use case of, uh, you know, uh, or our proposal of a use case is. Um, as I said, this is just one of the use case. Uh, assuming that you, there is a photos upload or a media upload uh, website, which also need to process media. So in that kind of application, one function, which, you know, I'm showing um, on the left side here in this diagram, uh, can receive media uh, that that gets triggered from HTTP request. Once the media is received, it can be stored on persistent volumes. Uh, and uh, depending upon the processing needs, if, if every request or every uh, received file or data stream need to be processed at the same time, there could be another trigger to trigger another function or an application. Uh, which basically process at that time, or it can process uh, at a later when, when there is enough to process. So let's uh, basically um, show this uh, in, a, in a demo. Uh, I'll show you a demo here, how we set this up in Fission uh, serverless framework and how, how we use that. Um, demo, please. Oh, um, okay. So we have uh, we have a fission serverless framework, which where we have multiple functions. So this is what we are showing that you know it receives uh, media, which basically um, the function to receive that media is upload. When a user um, sends media, uh, upload function uh, gets triggered. Here in this demo, I'm just doing it manually uh, from a curl. So we'll see that this media file now gets stored on data, which was earlier not there. Uh, and then uh, once one or more files are ready to be processed, uh, we can trigger another function. Uh, or another job outside the serverless framework, however you want to do. So that job or function, uh, in this, in our case, it's a, it's a process function. We see that it, it basically processed from beautiful to more beautiful picture. Uh, then you can process multiple pictures and uh, that's, that's basically one of the use case as I uh, discussed earlier of using serverless framework with persistent storage. So now um, Rico will um, talk about some of the other um, trends or happening uh, things in this, this space. 
Yeah, so um, what about other type of work uh, that's been going on uh, with uh, serverless and uh, stateful applications? So a lot of it happening maybe between 2017 and last year. Uh, obviously, there might be something this year. Uh, one of the examples is uh, Pocket. It's a storage system for serverless analytics type of applications. So it's a multi-tier storage system. It's still a research project. Uh, it's available on GitHub uh, if you want to take a look. Uh, but essentially, yeah, it's it's uh, basically uh, you have many servers in multiple tiers, and it allows you to have this way to attach storage to different serverless functions. Then another uh, paper uh, in research going on uh, is this uh, uh, paper specifically from Berkeley. Uh, it's called Serverless Computing, uh, One Step Forward, Two Steps Back. And it, it talks about how serverless is it's a trend of the future. And um, a lot of developers like it because they don't have to worry about that infrastructure in the back. Uh, but yeah, there's still a lot of challenges when it comes to processing uh, lots of data. So typically you have a uh, uh, serverless function uh, doing asynchronous type of work where you pick up uh, maybe an event and then you tell some other server or service uh, behind a lot of servers that needs to process some amount of data. For example, uh, reading from a queue and then send in over some large amount of data to Amazon S3. Uh, so that is uh, a typical use case, but if you want to do uh, functions or, or, or code that actually needs to pass a lot of information inside the function, so say uh, you want to pass uh, a, a large amount of uh, variables inside a, func a function for some reason, maybe you're streaming data. So th they mentioned that there's a lot of challenges around that aspect, right? So, so, um, but yet there, there's a lot of promise there. Uh, and lastly, uh, Aurora Serverless is the service that resembles more to what we're talking about here which is pay as you go. So you're paying for all the reads and writes. Uh, and there's a couple of papers available on Amazon Aurora and you know the, or they show a lot of the architecture that's behind Aurora, but yet they don't show you how they specifically, specifically implement the serverless part, uh, how they make it so that they're only charging for reads and writes, uh, whether they're using NVMe storage or, or what, what are they using in the back. So uh, that actually is not a, a, um, shared by Amazon, but yet, yet this resembles the most to, to what we're talking about here. So what does it look like uh, in terms of these workloads uh, in, in the future? What, what can we see uh, going forward? So we talked about uh, the uh, fission framework, and we talked about PVs, physical volumes, and PVCs. Uh, for these to uh, be able to be accessed by functions, we had to pre-provision this initially. So maybe we'll see some of this uh, automatic provisioning from these frameworks uh, so that allows you to like automatically pick up this physical volume and PVC from Kubernetes and attach it to a specific node and then just run the function whenever you want to and then maybe read or write uh, depending on the operation you're doing. Uh, so maybe we'll see uh, more support from some of these cloud providers uh, for uh, their own serverless type of offerings. So maybe Amazon EBS mounting for uh, Lambda functions, right? So you can read and write Specifically, you don't know whether EBS will be using something like NVMe or Fabric, but then maybe possibly you can have fast storage. Uh, just recently, AWS EFS storage was announced, uh, and then this is a way to mount uh, uh, EFS storage on AWS Lambda. So it, it, that's exactly what was announced, and, and Lambda uh, attachment of EFS storage. But one of the downsides of EFS storage is that um, it's kind of slow, you know, it's not very high performance. So it's good for kind of slow type of maybe batch type of applications, but then if you want like high performance type of applications, it may not be the best fit. 
And then maybe we'll see more integrations with like uh, uh, some of these stateful applications that we talked about in the beginning, like MySQL of the world, or Postgres, where they specifically allow you to, you know, attach to a function or, or, or have a function do a read and write operation. Obviously, you can do this with libraries now, but then there's no specific kind of uh, integration or, or built-in integration or, or friendliness uh, between these uh, two uh, type of technologies. And then uh, we talked about fission, and, and so uh, PVC and PV attachment, uh, as of today, we didn't see that it was available in Knative and OpenFast, some of the most popular uh, serverless frameworks. So possibly we'll see this support in the future. So now uh, MRG will wrap it up and talk about some of, some of the takeaways. All right, so uh, let's see what we have uh, discussed so far, uh, put everything uh, together into perspective. Um, as we um, started our session, this is more of an idea and then we are all discovering use cases or we are more than use cases, we are all solving problems that we otherwise have uh, by putting various pieces together, various technologies together. Um, many technologies, they are basically new, they came almost at the same time and now uh, if we put everything together, they are ready to solve modern day uh, infrastructure uh, problems. So the serverless um, framework, uh, basically it offers you to run um, functions uh, or the codes very short lived. Uh, and then you can choose uh, the language that, that you like. Uh, keep it simple and then um, the serverless frameworks, somehow it should be, or it is possible to run it outside Kubernetes, but Kubernetes uh, offers uh, objects, customer resources, and other things uh, that, you know, they, they it's, it's, it's hard to think that serverless framework uh, can be run outside Kubernetes. So it's, it's better to leverage what Kubernetes offers. Um, so, fast storage which offers disaggregation of storage or centralization of storage so that uh, it uh, retains uh, flexibility um, those technologies nvme and vme over fabric and fast ethernet or, or the media transport technologies they all are basically here to help and put everything uh, together again this is uh, this is a beginning of putting all this together there will be many trial and errors going forward uh, and remember, serverless is a pay as you go. It's an on-demand framework, very short-lived functions. So um, I hope that uh, all of us together, we will come uh, with more use cases uh, in before we have uh, a next session. Um, so now we will basically um, uh, kind of uh, show you all the references that, that we use for this talk or we, you can go uh, for more details, uh, this presentation will be available online. You can uh, refer to these links later on. And if you have to um, reach us, these are our uh, Twitter handles. We are basically excited, would be eager to talk to uh, any and all of you. So we'll open up for questions, uh, please. Uh, this is a virtual event, so please type your questions and we are ready to uh, answer all of them here. All right, so we have some questions. Uh, we have a question from Ra Frank. Uh, it says, are there any projects focused on high availability for MVME over Fabric? Uh, so I think um, I will hand this off to Amarjit because he's most familiar with MVME over Fabric. I'm not aware of any uh, projects uh, doing that uh, specifically. Um, so maybe uh, Emergent, yeah, are yeah. you on? Yeah, 
Yeah, thanks, thanks, Rico. Uh, so that's a good question. Um, I'm not aware of any specific project that that is being worked on um, to do uh, redundancy or resiliency, um, or maybe high availability of NVM over fabric. But I would like to comment here on this question in a couple of ways. One is NVMe over fabric, it brings volumes from one centralized disaggregated storage to many uh, clients. Those clients or initiators or hosts, they run applications. Those applications uh, could be one of the modern applications like MongoDB, Cassandra, and all that. So such applications, they offer high availability right from application. All they need is uh, fast storage, but they can and they can offer high availability out of them. So the second uh, way of looking at it is if, if application doesn't offer, that natively many Linux uh, projects such as MD or uh, maybe there are a few others, uh, when you bring multiple uh, volumes from multiple um, you know storage nodes into into one client or initiator uh, native linux technologies or uh, some of the pre existing technologies as i said such as md uh, they can be used to bring uh, high availability uh, into infrastructure so that's what i will basically i think that's what i in the market or in the uh, you know community. I don't see any more questions. I only see two. Uh, Frank, I hope that answered your question. So if you have any more questions, uh, feel free to type them on the chat. All right, so I think we have a couple more minutes, so um, we'll remain here if somebody has any questions. So. Oh, I have another question here, so from Alejandro. Um, uh, he says, what's the name of the serverless framework that was used in the demo? Uh, yeah, the serverless framework that we use in the demo is, is Fission. Um, the website is fission.io. You can look at it. Um, and then all the documentation, the way to set up is available. Let's see if there is any other question. Support. Uh... Yeah. yeah, so what? I was going to say that that's the only framework that we found that supports uh, Kubernetes PVCs and PVs uh, right now. Uh, so we expect some of the other frameworks to support that in the future, uh, like Knative and OpenFast, but we didn't see that support there yet. OK, 
Okay, we have 10 seconds, I think. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, feel free to reach uh, reach to reach out to us. Uh, we, we're available on Twitter, so we're happy to talk.